Good morning, world. Before I go into the um, subject of this video, I um, I want to share with you just about a minute of the truth that I'm feeling in my body right now. So I'm just gonna set my timer for one minute. get the scenery around me while I do this. Good looking sun, right? Alright, so my timer's set for one minute. So, here's my truth. Basically, I woke up this morning and I want to feel like I have tremendous gratitude for every moment and every breath I have, but when I wake up sometimes I just don't feel that. Um, and that is something that I'm wondering about because I want to be completely grateful for everything. I want to cultivate gratitude, but um, I don't feel this tremendous wonder and magic that I sometimes read about people feeling, but something that um, something that I've read about lately uh, from some Buddhist monks and so on and so on is that you know it's not necessarily important to feel excited and joyful all the time in whatever we're doing um, because obviously that's kind of like a high it's very you know it's really important I think is to kind of see things the way they are and just enjoy it as it goes on so there's my timer um, so on that note, I think um, something that's, again, really important is just to breathe into the moments that we're experiencing, notice the way that we're feeling, the way that we're reacting to things. Um, and I think the more that we see in this clear way, the more that we see who we are and what's going on in our lives and all of these things, it to me, it feels like it opens up a really beautiful path to be grateful because you know I have a house to live in I have food I have blonde hair that I love I have water to drink you know I have good water too spring water so the point is I think every moment is just an opportunity to continue to breathe to continue to attempt to let go of beliefs that are limiting us and so that's kind of um, a, something that comes to my mind in the morning you know I'm not gonna necessarily feel like some what I envision a monk feels like where I'm just completely at peace and satisfied with everything but um, I think the best we can do is attempt to embody that um, that mindset as my boss said uh, the other day I have a great boss his uh, my boss for landscaping he said that just like a Buddhist monk can sit in the fire and be like, I'm all right, this is, you know, I'm no problem, supposedly, um, you know, um, we should maybe act in a way that the little fires of everyday life don't, don't affect us so much. Um, I think that was very wise. So anyway, you might be wondering what I'm making this video for this morning. Um, basically, I'm here sitting in the sun. Again, I give you a little glimpse of that. It's, uh, about 9.30 in the morning, and um, basically, I just want to talk a little, bit, a little bit about why this morning sun, why what I'm doing right now is the most important thing for health on Earth of any human being, homo sapiens sapiens. There are other factors that are critical in health, of course, but this is the most important. So, um, well, why not start from the beginning? About four billion years ago or so, life began in um, at hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean due to the infrared energy that was coming from these hydrothermal vents called black smokers. And still, there's tons of life down there. Now the cool part is that sunlight actually wasn't critical for these living organisms because they had this infrared light that was able to do something called charge separating water and create these massive um, proton gradients. Just this, you know, this is a bit scientific, but anyway, through a lot of 
biophysical magic, not really magic, just uh, natural following of the laws of nature, um, living organisms emerged and eventually they moved up through the ocean and towards the surface where they were able to begin to utilize this constant bright strong source of energy called the sun in order to exist. But for about out of four billion years since life began supposedly, that's the um, theorized number, only for one and a half billion years has there been anything more complex than bacteria and archaea. Now, you might ask, what does that mean? Um, and essentially, what that means is that um, all living organisms for that introductory period of time were single-celled organisms. They are like the bacteria. Morning, Olympia, how's it going? That's my neighbor, she's a really cute girl, um, always saying hi to me. Um, so basically all bacteria and archaea are single-celled organisms. Single-celled organisms, they're, they're tiny, they're living on the street, they're living on my skin, on everyone's skin, in our guts. They're really small. And so I was wondering how um, life became more complex all my life and eventually as I learned about uh, biology and about these things called mitochondria it began to make a bit more sense so essentially what happened is one and a half billion years ago two of these bacteria they kind of made a deal just so you know the reason they couldn't become more complex is because um, all that life does is it takes energy from the environment to prevent the processes of decay that naturally occur in nature, like entropy it's called, when a river flows to the point of least resistance, when someone farts in a room and the gas spreads equally all across the room. Well, that's what life takes energy and uses it to prevent those processes. And it does that, most, well, all living organisms do that using um, genes, essentially. Genes are used to create proteins that carry out functions that further uh, permit us to stay away from those processes of decay. So the most energy expensive thing that a living organism does is protein synthesis, ma making proteins and maintaining its genes. And this is stuff that I was told by, um, I learned from Dr. Doug Wallace, um, a researcher at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia who's won many awards for his work and he's on the way potentially to win a Nobel Prize. His work's fantastic um, and really insightful on the causes of disease but anyway so this is what the original living organisms spent all of their energy on it was just maintaining themselves building and maintaining themselves and they couldn't get any more complex now fast forward three and a half billion years from the beginning of life where there was only single-celled organisms um, and this could still have happened at the bottom of the ocean I'm not exactly sure of the details on that one but just keep in mind everything was like a bacteria or an archaea single-celled organism so you had two types of bacteria uh, in this one event that I'm talking about. There's an archaeobacteria and an oxidative cyanobacteria. Now in our cells today, the host with the cytosol, which is where all of the structure is, and the nucleus, that's the host. That is descended from the archaeobacteria I'm talking about. Today, we have mitochondria in each of my human cells. So I have 100 trillion human cells right here. Now. In each of them, there's between 1,000 and 2,000 mitochondria, approximately. 1,000 and 2,000 individual bacteria in each of my 100 trillion cells. That's 10 time, 1.0 times 10 to the 17th um, power. So that's a lot of mitochondria in, every, in all of our, our entire organism. But um, essentially, these two bacteria decided to make a deal. The one bacteria, for example, if it, let's just pretend they're people. The one bacteria, the archaeobacteria that became the, the, new, the host cell, so to speak, basically said, hmm, I noticed that you and a thousand of your buddies are um, spending so much energy maintaining the exact same copies of genes and bu building yourselves and carrying out all these same functions. How about this? Uh, and, that's what, and that's what you're using all of your energy to do, you mitochondria your oxidative cyanobacteria. Now how about this? I'll take 1,000 of you into me, and what we'll do is we'll delete all of your genes, all of approximately 1,000 genes that they each have, 1,000 genes each that they're maintaining, so that now all you have to do 
is maintain just 13 genes. So you're gonna have so much energy left over for not uh, copying, uh, using those genes to make proteins, and then maintaining those genes themselves and maintaining the proteins themselves. So you don't have to do that anymore, mitochondria, oxidative cyanobacteria, I'll do that for you. So now I only need, as the host cell, I only need to keep one, well, two copies for sexual reproduction, two copies of those genes in the nucleus, in my host central area for putting the genes. So just so you guys know, this became part of what we now know as the mitochondrial genome. So within our nucleus, there are a thousand genes or so that code just to create mitochondria, a thousand mitochondria. Now in that process, that ended up saving like a massive, massive percentage. I think like greater than 90% of all the energy that the mitochondria were using is now completely free because they don't have to use it on those maintaining all of those thousand genes and all of, all of that basically. They only need to maintain 13. So all of that leftover energy is now free for this one cell. So what this one cell can do now in order to increase its survivability is create more complexity. It can create a greater colony, which we now see as eukaryotes, multicellular organisms, anything greater than bacteria. So if you look around, grass, um, by the way, I have shorts on, I'm not naked, no worries. Um, grass, any plants, anything that is green, anything that's a plant, anything that's a fungi, anything that's living that's bigger than a single cell, yeast, bugs, all of these things fit into this category of eukaryotes or multicelled organisms. So you can know that each of them has hundreds of mitochondria in every single cell that makes them up. And the mitochondria are the things that provide the energy for this to occur. So here's a great example. If you want to test this, now I'm not saying you should because it's true, but you can just try holding your breath for about 20 minutes and let me know how that goes. See, mitochondria Remember I said oxidative cyanobacteria, they use oxygen to make energy. And since we deleted all of those genes, um, they can only use oxygen. It, it, they might have been able to use like some other bacteria, nitrogen and other gases to, provide en uh, to produce energy, but now it's only oxygen. So if you hold your breath, you terminate mitochondrial function. You, oxygen is called a terminal electron acceptor. So just like in your house, you have a power station, a base station, well not in your house, but you have a base station pushing voltage to uh, push the electrons flowing in your wires uh, you know at 60 Hertz um, so they're uh, constantly alternating like every second 60 times it switches back and forth and that basically provides the energy for the electrons to flow in any of your electrical devices and keep our electrical grid going now that's a push on our in our mitochondria on the electron transport chain, which is where the electrons flow, kind of like the wires in your house to keep us alive, there's oxygen at the end pulling. So it's just a pull instead of a push, but oxygen pulls the electrons toward it to create that voltage. And if you stop that voltage, that flow of electrons, then we're toast, you're dead immediately. Another uh, way that you can know this is true is um, cyanide. How does cyanide work? Does anyone know? It's the, the cyanide is the molecule that people ke kept around their neck in a little pill in World War One. So if they were captured, they eat it dead immediately. They die right away. Have a great day. So basically, um, cyanide stops the flow of electrons on the electron transport chain in mitochondria by destroying the function of something called cytochrome C oxidase, if I'm not mistaken. I'm very, pretty sure that that's the part where it acts in mitochondria, but the point is, destroys mitochondrial function in all of the thousand mitochondria in each of our cells, so we die immediately. In other words, you and I are not just a colony of human cells, we're a symbi symbiotic colony of bacteria, basically of bacteria, of different kinds of bacteria that created a more complex super cell. In other words, each of our cells is, is like kind of a, like a master with a thousand servants working for him, where they have a place to stay, they have you know, all the energy they could possibly need and they're completely protected, and they work together to give the energy to the master cell, which basically is able to create so much complexity even things like a human brain, which has more mitochondria than any other organ um, in existence on Earth because we were able to compact so many mitochondria into our brain and that's why it has so much ability to create massive complexity, 
and do all the things we, ha uh, we do. And the other tissue, besides the brain with the most mitochondria, is our heart, the two that use the most energy. Obviously, they're gonna have the most energy producers. So, basically, that's what happened in order to merge these two organisms. Um, and after that, the rest is a wrap. One and a half billion years, eukaryotes took over the world. And you can see this because plants and animals cover the world. Plants, more so than animals, honestly, we think we run the world. You know, the plants kind of, you know, they got us beat slightly, but they can't move. We can move, we can cut them down, which is not necessarily the best thing. But um, anyway, so now that we have these eukaryotes, these multicellular organisms, they've come to the surface of the oceans, they've come um, onto land eventually. But once we came into the solar light, basically the first thing that organisms once exposed to solar light had to develop in order to survive, because again, an organism is just a, a, an entity in nature um, that uses energy to defy processes of decay. So half the day, depending on where you are on Earth, we have this energy to do that, and half the day we don't. So again, most organisms um, were always asleep, technically. You know, bacteria aren't, you wouldn't consider them to be awake. But eventually wakefulness was evolved, so wakefulness came to be so that we could go out and gather more energy from food, from light, and things like that, especially from food, though. Um, and, you know, hunt, obviously, prey, that's, that's what we're doing in that wakeful time. That's the main focus. Reproducing is obviously something we do while we're wakeful. Um, and conscious and awake. So basically, um, we had to develop a way of knowing when we're gonna be exposed to this energy and when we're not, you know? And, and the thing is, it's good because it's pretty consistent So throughout the day. So essentially, we developed something called the circadian clock or a circadian rhythm, where in circa dies, in Latin, circadian circa dies means around the day. So it just goes around the day. So we know when we're in the sun and we know when it's, when it's dark and sun and dark and so when we're in the sun we know we're supposed to wake up and go and reproduce and get food and breathe and drink water and so on and so on and then in the dark we restore to our original primitive state of sleep which is where we've compacted all of our repair and growth so we absorb a bunch of nutrients and things during the day and we assimilate them and build and repair while we sleep now here's the thing, your circadian rhythm doesn't work by itself. In other words, if you there's experiments where if you take people and you put them in the ground in a cave, their circadian rhythm, you know, where they're always in the dark, by the way, no lights, their circadian rhythm shifts like an hour forward every single day. So after just a few days or a few weeks, they're completely shifted and it just continues to shift. So in other words, this rhythm doesn't just maintain itself. You know, it does maintain it. Before our eye was a camera, before we could actually see things, our eye had a, a function of a clock. And maybe our eye didn't look the way that it did. You know, I'm not talking about humans. I'm talking about very primitive organisms in the past. Um, but essentially, um, we had this camera so that anytime we were alive, our body could know when it was daytime and when it was night. And so the camera, in our eye at least, the function still remains, the, there's a protein, a photoreceptor called melanopsin, okay? And this photoreceptor basically receives all frequencies of blue light between 400 nanometers and 465 nanometers. That's just the measurement of the wavelength of the light. And the reason that our brain absorbs these frequencies is because they've always been present on Earth during daytime. And so these tell our brain when, they, when, they, when we see them that the sun is up and it's time to wake up. And so things happen like we stop making melatonin, which is our sleep chemical for repair and everything. We make more cortisol, which is a stress hormone to wake us up, get us moving. Um, and all of these processes are occurring due to this light exposure on our eye. So then think about this. Where I am right now, I'm lucky it's September, there's still some good sun. But think about when it's December in Philadelphia. The sun doesn't rise until 7.30 or 8, and it sets around 4.30 on the shortest day of the year. So a lot of people, including myself and my friends over our time in school, we wake up, okay? We get up, and the sun's not out. It's dark, but we're blasting our brain with fake light, okay? And then 
continue a little forward. We go to school, we're inside under fake light all day, so we haven't gotten a glimpse of sunlight because, you know, maybe the sun was coming up between walking from our, you know, our car where we're blocked from the full spectrum by the glass windows, or maybe, just maybe, um, we're staring at our phone on the way into school, but even more likely is that the, in the winter, there's no light at all before we go into school, so we're getting blasted by this fake light, and this has so much blue light because to try to make these lights energy efficient, they basically removed all of the full spectrum, all of the ultraviolet frequencies of light and, and infrared. Well, there was no ultraviolet necessarily, but they removed all the infrared light. And essentially what that did, they put a ton of blue to make it bright and visible, but what that does is it just tells our brain that there is a tremendous, tremendous amount of sunlight out. Like, I'm talking, it tells our brain it's like the middle of summer on the equator on the in the middle of the day that's how much blue lights in these lights in the CFL lights the LED lights your computer light and your phone light okay you get that so basically what that's telling your brain is to make a tremendous tremendous amount of cortisol this stress hormone tremendous amount of cortisol now that cortisol here's the problem that cortisol it comes from a precursor molecule called pregnenolone which comes from a precursor called cholesterol um, and basically when we're stealing all of that pregnenolone to make cortisol, it's no longer going to make the other things that it's supposed to make, testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. And you might know those as our sex steroid hormones or the most important hormones for our health and physique, as well as longevity, energy, uh, some of the most important, as well as sexual reproduction. So if you're constantly doing this, you're constantly blasting people with bright, mostly blue frequency lights that are stealing their pregnenolone and making it into cortisol, what do you think you might have? Well, probably you'll have a ton of really, really stressed out people because their stress hormone's so high that even the smallest little things, you know, just make us jump, like, oh my God. Um, and likewise, what you'll probably have is uh, a infertility epidemic. Now, does that sound like anything any of you guys are familiar with? Like maybe the world today, you know, uh, one in seven couples can't get pregnant and the numbers are only skyrocketing. And then we have this massive epidemic of just stress where everyone is absolutely just totally stressed out. I mean, ask anyone, you know, how do you feel stressed on a regular basis? And most people, unless you're somewhere where they don't have this issue, like a tribe or somewhere in a third world country, they'll probably tell you, yeah, I'm pretty stressed. Like I feel stressed, my school, my work. And one of the reasons people don't perceive because we can't perceive the, the camera or the, pardon, we can't perceive the clock vision of our eye is all of this fake light is doing this to us. And this is proven, you can look this up, Harvard University has done studies on it, all kinds of experts on photobiology and so on have done these studies. So they're there, you can check them out if you'd like. But basically, um, the take home point is that if you aren't going out into the sun in the morning because man has created all of these disconnects, we've created fake light, We've created clocks, alarms, and schedules that no longer align us with the cycles of the sun since the Industrial Revolution. We've created glass and these things where we think we're getting the full spectrum of light, but we're actually not. Um, you know, we wake up, most people just wake up, they stay indoors, they have their coffee, they look, watch their TV, they never go outside. So if you're not going outside, Basically what you're doing is you're never starting your circadian clock. So people wonder why they stay up so late and they don't get tired, they don't fall asleep well, and then why they wake up with an alarm and they don't feel rested. It's because you've never gotten your circadian clock working such that it can even know that it's time to rest. See, we don't just sleep at night because everyone else is sleeping at night. It's not like we just chose to sleep at night because it's what everyone else is doing. No, evolution had a sleeping at night because daytime is when we go out and we absorb nutrients and we're awake and we absorb the energy of the sun as well. Nighttime is when there's none. So we use the strength of the Earth's magnetic field, which is stronger at night when the sun isn't present, to help repair our cells and as also all of the things we've absorbed throughout the day. A critical thing is in the morning, we make melatonin as well as dopamine, but we make melatonin on our eye with the exposure to ultraviolet light. It's catalyzed from the, the ultraviolet energy, helps to catalyze the reaction from certain amino acid precursors. And you can read about this on the blog of a neurosurgeon named Dr. Jack Cruz. He's laid it out in blog series that really could be multiple books, each 
blog posts could almost be a short book if, if made into one or each series could definitely be a book, absolutely. And he'll probably will be releasing them. But um, there's a, a series called the Time Series. Look up Time and Jack Cruz, J-A-C-K-K-R-U-S-E dot com, Jack Cruz uh, dot com. And you can read about all this stuff. He's one of the pioneers in the field doing this research uh, or putting together the pieces of research that's already been done, some of it for a very long time. So, you know, I didn't think this was going to go for 25, 30 minutes, but, you know, that's what happens when you're explaining something in depth. Um, essentially, the most important factor for people to know is if you're not doing what I'm doing right now, every single morning getting sunlight on your skin and your eye, then you're creating a massive circadian disruption. You're going to be um, exposing yourself to a bunch of fake light in order to wake up and do your work, and that's going to create massive hormonal imbalances in your body. You know, eventually, very quickly, it'll create burnout. Um, you know, some people, there's like a, I mean, most people might not be familiar with this, but there's kind of a question, uh, at least I've heard people talking about it um, in the scientific world, where uh, some young children are hitting puberty such, at such early ages. Well, one of the reasons why this could be happening is because this massive, um, this massive berating of artificial light, just tons of it, and that's what all the little kids are getting exposed to would force the body to try to hit puberty and express its um, sexual abilities really early in order to reproduce to save the organism and the, ge the germline, but um, ultimately it's like a last ditch mechanism. It's like, uh, you know, try to do this because those, those people, they're, bur they're burning out really early because they don't have that constant ultraviolet energy, full spectrum sunlight energy, the proper repair during nighttime, during sleep in order to foster healthy reproduction. And so nature by natural selection is making people infertile. Um, and this is a very, very, I think, you know, it's a tragic thing for the people who are experiencing it, absolutely. And it's even more tragic that it's caused by people in the scientific community who are, who lie, who um, have failed to see where the evidence is actually pointing, and more, even more so, people in the corporate world who are failing to completely to um, look at the scientific evidence before releasing products for use on the masses. Um, such as these new types of energy efficient light bulbs. The reason they're energy efficient is because they're stealing light from your brain. They're not stealing it, but they're just take, subtracting light that you should be living on. That's how they're energy efficient. And in the process, because they lower their dopamine level, because they don't have any ultraviolet to make um, dopamine starting in your eye, they make people more obedient and less uh, thinking outside the box, less willing to question stuff, um, and obviously less happy and, and you know, more upset and stressed as well. So all you have to do, people always ask these questions, what do I do? When you wake up, before you do anything else, you walk outside. It's not like something new. It's actually nothing different from what we would have done naturally. It's what you're actually doing is removing disconnects that you've created. So don't think of it as adding anything. Just remove all the disconnects. Remove the clothes. Remove the sunglasses, the glasses, the contacts. Do not put them on. Never put contacts on your eyes. Never put sunglasses on your eyes. Um, except maybe if you're inside under bright fake light at night and you have nothing else to wear, but never put sunglasses on your eye during the daytime because you're distorting the spectrum that programs all of your hormones in your cells and everything and times your circadian rhythm and that will screw you up even if you don't know it. Um, then remove the glass, remove the walls, remove the blankets, just walk on out and have yourself exposed. And as long as you can, if you can only muster up three minutes, your quality of health is gonna reflect that, um, that circumstance that, you know, cause your job or, you know, uh, cause you're afraid to bring your kids out in the sun with you because you think they're gonna get skin cancer cause you haven't done your research um, and looked at the current state of affairs in science world. If you want to look at a paper, a research paper that kind of does a great job of summary, summarizing this issue, there's one called the risks and benefits of sun exposure 2016 and the risks and benefits of sun exposure 2016. You can find that anywhere. Um, there's a website called tandfonline.com that I think uh, is one of the first results that'll come up in Google. There's other research papers. There's a study that was done in, um, in Sweden with 30,000 women approximately where they measured all these factors in their life to figure out what contributed most to mortality. And what they found is that lack of sun exposure had the highest 
impact on mortality rates, even more than smoking cigarettes. Hmm, what is, well that, what that basically means is that avoiding the sun is worse for you than smoking cigarettes. Now you don't have to believe me, but you can go and look at the study, read it, you know, it's done over many, many years with 30,000 people approximately, and um, this is what these experts found. Um, and it makes sense when you understand that light is foundational to biology and all of these chemicals and things are not. So in other words, if you are in the sun and your redox potential is high, redox is just a measure of the amount of electrical charge in each of your cells stored in your cell water, essentially. If that's high, then you can handle exposure to chemicals. You can do a better job of detoxing from these things, of removing them. Just so you know, detoxing with all these juices and all herbs and juice drinks and everything that people do, if you don't have a high redox potential in your cells to support that detox in order to, to keep the effects going on a long term, you're gonna have to do that once a week, once a month to feel good. And even then, you're still not fixing the underlying problem of um, lack of solar exposure or excess fake light. So basically, I made a video yesterday uh, about my um, blue blockers that I made, the most important other thing you can do besides being exposed to this sunlight in the morning in order to start your circadian rhythm every single day and get all of your hormone timing proper is once the sun goes down, slap on a pair of blue blockers to protect yourself from man-made light. Now don't think of it as doing anything additional, think of it as trying to remove one of the disconnects that man has created. And in order to do that, if your family or the people around you or you're just outside where you can't control the lights, if people are stubborn, you know, you can't use red lighting or candles uh, or fire or something, then you just need to get a pair of these blue blockers. And you know, it's, it's best if you don't have any light at all or you have dim light, but if that's all you can do, it's a great, great place to start. Now, um, with those, I mean, this, that's, you can just watch that video and you'll have everything you need to know. But just know, the more of this you can do first thing in the morning, you know, maybe, maybe you come outside for a few minutes and then you go back inside, make your breakfast, and then come outside to eat your breakfast and stay out here with your skin exposed, bare feet on the ground, grounded, drinking good, good spring water that you can take in your body, charge, separate, and structure so that it can hold energy and be part of the battery that powers life. That's the topic of, of other videos. But just know, that's what you, this is what you need to do for health. If you're not doing this every single morning, then you are accelerating your path to, towards aging and disease. For those wondering, I do this every single morning without failure. There's never a morning where I don't do this, even if it's cloudy. Even if it's cloudy, there's still more than uh, you know 30% of light still coming through. You can see the light's still there. Um, and so you need that on your eye and your skin, even if it's freezing cold. The fact that it's freezing cold actually cools our surfaces and the water in our body so that we can absorb more of the light that is there in the winter. So it's great to have your skin exposed in the winter. Um, if we can't burn fat properly to keep ourselves warm in those freezing temperatures, which we can't because we're disconnected, it is a signal of an underlying mitochondrial issue or a chronic disconnect from nature, which is natural because that's how we live. So we gotta start where we can. So every morning, go outside, start building your dopamine up, go into the sun. If you want, do some yoga, do some meditating, lay on a towel, like I have a towel there, uh, sit in a chair, uh, you know, definitely face the sun for at least a bit, get it on your eye, but you could also lay on your stomach if you really want, if it feels great on your back, it probably means that you need some of that sun on your back. Um, you know, and, and then throughout the day, later in the day, if you can um, get some sun at the stronger times of the day, so you make, because you're not making vitamin D at this time, you're just starting your circadian clock and absorbing some of that infrared light, which is like that light from the geothermal, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean or from a fire or from a sauna, that provides energy um, to create structured water in our cells, which again, is charge separating the water between positive and negative charge, and the negative charge acts as kind of a battery for, um, or both of them together, they act as a battery for uh, energy flows and enzymatic fluxes to occur in biology. This is really what powers biology. And again, this is the subject of more videos and blogs in the future. Um, any other questions I'm thinking people might want to ask? When you go out in the middle of the day, you know, uh, you won't burn probably. No matter how light your skin is, you probably won't burn around sunrise or earlier in the day because there's not much ultraviolet present. But then, you should also try to get some during your lunch break if you can, or really, you know, if you have an outdoor job is ideal. Um, have your skin exposed to the sun, get that vitamin D. You can use cool baths, you know, a lake or a beach if you're so lucky um, to cool your skin. Um, and you know, that's that's that. You know, people always wonder why do I feel so good at the beach? Why do people sleep so well? Well, because you're getting so much sunlight.
because and, and therefore you're making melatonin, you're getting your circadian rhythm more aligned. Even if you are using fake light at night at the beach, you're still giving yourself a massive benefit that you weren't getting before, but you'd be getting even more of a benefit to your health bank account by adding the sunlight and adding blue blockers to prevent that fake light from stealing from your health bank account balance. So, you know, that's, uh, I did not think this was gonna go so long, but that is basically the message. Sunlight does a ton of other things besides in training our circadian rhythm, but that is a critical one because all of our living functions, if they didn't have timing to occur on, then we would just be a complete jumble of chemicals on the street, you know, like it, it, things would go out of control, we'd have uncontrolled growth, we'd have cancer. How's it going? <laughs> oh yeah. So uh, my neighbors are always out here, you know, saying, this one guy across the street, he's always saying like, oh, you look so great, you know, and the reason he thinks I look good you know, um, is because, at least I think, and from the experience of many years, is because I've started fixing my light environment so that I'm making more of my sex steroid hormones, so I have a very high testosterone level, which presents itself as muscles and physical health and reproductive health and everything, which generally presents as, um, you know, sexual attraction. I'm not being narcissistic at all, I'm, I'm speaking purely in terms of just the science um, and th the point of this is that if you are unhappy with your body and the way that you look your hormones might be off and the main reason your hormones are probably off in this modern world actually certainly the main reason is because you have an altered light environment that's causing that problem for you so you might not think oh you know my body could never change but actually it can if you take the right steps because no organism is you know your body isn't stable every single night it's changing it's shifting if you didn't sleep for a week you'd be dead you know if you didn't drink water for a few days you'd be dead if you didn't eat for a month or so you'd, you'd probably be dead um, so the point is that our body's constantly shifting every six years they say every molecule in our body is different so if you I mean if you are doing things to cha change your cells the energy they have to carry out their functions you're gonna be a completely different person and so that's why this is so important. You can literally become more attractive. You can become more of the person you've wanted to be your entire life if you are providing yourselves with what they need to function. That's really the take home. Um, you know, people have always wondered like, what makes someone more attractive than others? Yeah, genes play a role, how your parents look, but really within one person, you know, everyone has genes of some kind and I truly believe and evidence shows that you could those genes could be made to look attractive, you know, in the case of someone who's like a, I don't know, someone who's really attractive, like a surfer, for example. Surfers are often great looking, they're always out in the sun and the water. Um, or um, like an obese person, you know, like you could go either way. And those, those obesity and really looking good, they're not caused by your genes. They're caused by mitochondrial function and energy flows in your cells to indicate to other potential mates how healthy you are, how reproductively fit you are. If you're obese, that's signaling to people that you're not healthy because you're living, you are you don't have the energy to produce healthy babies. And that's the number one cause of that in our modern society. People think it's eating too much food. Why do people eat too much food? It's because their mitochondria suck. So that they eat their carbs, they get a blood sugar spike, and then it goes back down, and then they need to eat more carbs. And all the while, every time they eat it, the insulin's spiking with the blood sugar, it's storing those sugars away in your fat, and then it, you can't, because your mitochondria are, are damaged because of a lack of sunlight and too much fake light, fake light suppresses melatonin, which is the number one mitochondrial repair molecule. That's one of the main ways that it works. And sunlight helps us make melatonin in the morning. That's really important too. But the point is, um, you eat carbs, this is how most people in our world live. You eat carbs, your blood sugar goes up, insulin goes up and stores it as fat. Now, because the mitochondria are damaged, you cannot tap your fat stores and burn fatty acids. That's one of the critical things in mitochondrial dysfunction. It's called the Warburg metabolism. We lose our ability to burn fat and we can only burn carbohydrates. And if you want, go to Dr. Jack Cruz's website, Jack Cruz, K R U S E dot com and look up a blog or just on Google look up reality number 14 reality number 14 Warburg's proof W A R B U R G apostrophe S Warburg's proof this guy named Warburg found in cancerous states a type of metabolism that could only burn sugar cancer cells 
Cancer cells still have mitochondria, but they can only burn sugar in their mitochondria. And this is because they lose the higher, more energy requiring process um, of beta oxidation, of fat burning, basically that's what that's called. And so they can only burn sugar. So if you know anyone, if you yourself find yourself that you have to eat carbs multiple times throughout the day, like the terrible health recommendations from the government are to eat many small meals, that will maybe give you energy, but that's a sign that our society is fundamentally mitochondrially broke, completely destroyed and trashed, that we need to be eating carbs every few hours in order to keep our blood sugar high so that we don't feel like we're starving to death. I remember when I was a little kid, I'd come home and I'd be like, mom, I'm starving, like literally. My blood sugar was low after not eating for so many hours and I literally felt like I was starving. That's how you feel and most people probably experience this. But now that I've improved my mitochondrial function, I can eat one huge meal in the morning, which is what I'm about to do, and then go landscape, physical hard labor for six to eight hours and then I come home and sometimes I'm not even hungry because I've tapped into my fat stores. I'm burning fat in order to make energy and that's what we need good mitochondria for. So the number one way to prevent getting overweight to, you know, if you think you eat too much um, because you don't have self-control, that's bullshit. I used to think that and that ended up with me kind of having an eating disorder. Um, but that's not the case. It's because your environment's damaged and that changes the type of food that you want to eat. So the environment that you're in, the way your mitochondria function dictates the food you're going to eat and the food you want to eat, not, 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 not your self-control, okay? So you want to fix your environment and then you will be able to eat bigger, healthier, higher natural fat and protein meals with some carbs as they're seasonal, but you won't need to eat them every few hours, which is what causes people to gain weight, and you'll be able to burn off your fat um, in order to keep yourself warm in the cold or just um, to keep yourself from being hungry. Um, you know, it depends what, uh, what time of year it is. Um, so this is critical for all aspects of health, and it all goes back to that fact that all living organisms on Earth, or all complex living organisms, all eukaryotes, stem from two types of bacteria, archaeobacteria and oxidative cyanobacteria. And when these came to the surface of the Earth, and so Earth to the surface of the Earth from the bottoms of the ocean and solar light, they were exposed to solar light they, about a half billion, one and a half billion years ago. We created these clocks in order to carry out our function, and we of course use sunlight to provide our main source of energy. Food was innovated afterwards as a source of energy. Food came afterwards, after sunlight, as an additional source of energy to create more complexity. But you would never, as you build up a pyramid, you know, food comes on top, you would never remove the bottom because then your pyramid would suck and it'd be better if you just didn't uh, add the top at all because you're removing the bigger foundation from the bottom. This is what sunlight is to our cells. So if you're deficient in sunlight, you're gonna not function anywhere near as well as you could. And you might think, oh, I'm doing pretty well. If you think you're doing well and you're fine with that, cool. But if you're interested in knowing how much better you could be doing, I encourage you to, I mean, thank, if you've already watched this video, you're set. You know all, all everything that you need to know if you've made it this far. Um, but that, my friends, is the most important factor in health. So I hope that you have a fantastic day and Get out in the sun, enjoy the light, get drunk on it, lots of love.